Hello everyone and welcome to Makai World Reviews. I am the Tony Makai, master of minds and of men. And I had a sick child there for a few days. So this one is a tiny bit late, but that's okay. You will be getting two Makai World Reviews this week. How lucky for you. But today and this month, we will be looking at movies with Mads Mikkelsen in them, obviously. Whether a starring role or not, we'll see. We start off with one I've never heard of before. After watching it, well, I have some idea why. Today, today we will have flickering lights. So hit that subscribe button, and let's open a restaurant. So, Flickering Lights, written and directed by Anders Thomas Jensen. I can personally say I've never seen anything this man has written nor directed, a majority of them being Danish. I have seen a few things he in some way or another helped with, but I'm kind of going into this one blind. Starring Soren Pilkmark, another gentleman I'm not terribly familiar with, having only seen him act in, in very brief things, but I'm, I'm hoping for the best. And of course, Mads Mikkelsen, uh, the man of the month, and I'm hopeful in watching his movies I learn more about Danish cinema. But he has been Hannibal Lecter, a James Bond villain, and in Star Wars. Needless to say, his career is doing pretty well, and he deserves all of it. The release date for this is November 3rd, 2000. And what came out around the same time? Charlie's Angels, one of the many reboots of the 1970s boob detective karate show, which would then include a TV reboot, a sequel to this, and a reboot of this, all to much diminishing returns. Movie that was what it was, and I, I think it knew that. Not really worth a watch, but hardly as bad as subsequent Angel Media. And Little Nicky, a movie that I don't quite hate as much as I should. I think that's thanks to some of the strength of the actors in it, uh, none of them being Adam Sandler. It's about the aforementioned Sandler being the son of the devil, played by Harvey Keitel. Not much else to say about that. Going over the plot... We come upon a quaint little restaurant somewhere in Denmark, and we see a picture on the wall of our main characters when they were younger. So we bury the lead right off the bat there. Going back in time some months, we meet the whole gang, and they are literally a gang as they participate in shady underworld activities, like selling bootleg cigarettes. Torquilled, the leader, at the end of his rope, Peter, who loves cocaine and punching, Arnie, who is the shifty gun seller, and Stefan, who eats a lot and has an annoying girlfriend. Speaking of girlfriends, Torquilds breaks up with them. I only mention that because she will be relevant for about 10 seconds near the end of the movie. Well, we learn the boys, at least Torquild, are in deep with some manner of crime boss whose group looks and functions like the old ECW faction, the Triple Threat. The main guy looks like Shane Douglas, the franchise. Then there's the goofy guy, that's Chris Candino, and the big bald guy, of course, Bam Bam Bigelow, which is how I'll be referring to these three henceforth. Well, the franchise has a new job for the boys. That's stealing a briefcase. But don't open it, he says. Well, they do just that. Open it, and it's full of money. No Pulp Fiction mysteries here. And during it, Peter is shot, and a security guard is killed, though no one seems to care about the security guard. So the gang flees, taking the money with them, and going to a remote area to hide away in a run-down restaurant. Well, they begin... Growing up or growing down, uh, which one, I don't know. They make friends with the locals, like the Dr. Carl and nearby neighbor and hunter Alfred. Torquil decides he wants to fix up this old restaurant with the money he stole, and well, that's what they do. In the end, Torquil's ex, who works for the newspaper, gives it a good review, despite the food sucking, in her words. Alfred also kills the triple threat when they come a-calling, though that feels almost like an afterthought. Hey, boy, I wish I had more to say about this plot, really. So let's talk about this movie, as yes, that's why we're here. We can start with the directing. Directing is solid. I mean, frankly, this is a real low-stakes movie in every sense of the way. But the directing is relatively on point. It's a movie that understands its nature and doesn't really try to reach too much further than that. Uh, it's solid. It's a film with very few mistakes. And I credit the directing with a lot of that. These men were on point in every scene. In fact, this and the actual camera work, which I'll talk about in a moment are probably the, the high points of the film. It's a tight film that tries to be a little over-ambitious, and that's where things kind of fall apart. But despite any and every shortcoming, it's a well-directed film. The cinematography, uh, man, there were some beautiful shots in this movie, genuinely. There were moments here, just moments, 
that belong in a much better movie. The scenes with Peter walking into the ocean, the shots of the restaurant at the beginning and ending, Arnie shooting the cows, a few other. There is weight and heft to them, and that's a shame because they are ultimately pointless thanks to the story, but it was an enjoyable film to look at. Some of the strength was due to the location and sets. A good portion of this takes place in the woods or at the restaurant, and it's nice to see the slow rebuilding of the restaurant as the film goes on. Frankly, I would have liked a little more of that as they finish it relatively quickly, and then it's just kind of, oh, we have a restaurant and, and we are open. <laughs> the woods is, is, is good too. We only get one real scene at the water, and it's probably the best in the movie, as well as some vague hunting trips with Arnie and Alfred. But yeah, no real complaints about the sets. Lighting was solid as well, especially in Peter's flashback where he's locked in a cabinet and the light breaks through. Uh, it was all the light he had. You know, there was a little, like, porthole. I'll speak on that a little more when I talk about the characters. But it was a nice-looking film, if, as usual, a little bit uninspired. As far as the story, you ever see a Guy Ritchie film? Picture that without any of the style, tension, or comedy, and you have this movie. It felt like a 2000s movie, which it was. Felt low stakes, mid medium effort, decently acted film that was just there to kill 145 minutes or whatever. It kept feeling like there should be something more. These people should be reacting stronger to the things happening around them. But it never happens. The villains are impotent. The protagonists are fine but shallow. The relationships really developed with Stefan and his girlfriend, Honey, who was totally and completely unlikable in just about every way. She was insipid and ignorant. And the times she should have depth, like when Torquid fucking punches her in the face, uh, go nowhere. Peter's shooting and coke addiction as well just kind of resolved themselves without any additions to the plot. He shot, oh, lay around for a few weeks. He's coke addicted, oh, sit in a cooler for a few days or so. It just had no real point. This movie is called a black comedy, but it wasn't black enough to really have an impact and not funny enough to be a comedy. There's also this thing where they talk about uh, watching the ABC miniseries from 1976, Rich Man, Poor Man, and depending on how many episodes it is. Torquilled insists that it's eight, but it was actually 12. So I just wish I had more to say about that, but that's what it is. That being said, the characters were at least mostly reasonably likable in their own way, though incredibly shallow. Torquilled is unquestionably the main character, and we spend the most time with him, including some backstory. Uh, but his backstory was the worst of them, with a whole... I guess it's a metaphor about apples growing on the family tree and his dad kills himself. Torquil is having some kind of midlife crisis, unable to get out from under the heel of the franchise, unable to establish himself as his own man. Why did he start the restaurant? I don't really know, as none of them know anything about cooking. So his motivations are, I don't want to be totally useless all the time, I guess. I also didn't really understand the ex-girlfriend stuff. They break up in a cold, as in emotionless scene then she comes back at the end to review his restaurant and we're supposed to feel something about this relationship we've seen for two minutes arnie who's mads himself is the most compelling character he had an abusive father a friend of his committed suicide due to a prank he pulled he's morose and odd he loves guns he bonds with alfred the hunter when he shoots one of alfred's cows with a desert eagle you know they bond over guns and their friendship is, is kind of satisfying He's the only one who makes an effort to try to learn how to cook. I don't know, he was by and far the best actor, obviously, and made the best of what he was given. Peter got a lot of background and attempted giving his fractured acting some depth. His father was expectedly abusive, locking him in a cabinet for smoking cigars until the father had a stroke. He has a coke addiction, he gets shot, he's responsible for the triple threat finding them, but he has little dialogue and little to do. He lies around in various ways, whines a bit, and is put to the wayside for the third act wrap-up. A real missed opportunity of a character. Stefan and his girlfriend, I don't know why either of them are in this movie. They had nothing. He eats all the time. And while they did all seem like friends, if they cut both Stefan and his girlfriend's scenes entirely, we would lose no nothing from the other friendships. And like I said, Torquid punches Stefan's girlfriend in, in the face. Stefan, I'm sorry. And that goes nowhere. So yeah, he does come up with the name of the restaurant from a poem by Tovey Dilfinston, excuse my pronunciation, shockingly entitled Flickering Lights. Now to the heroes of the movie. Alfred, the autistic hunter who bonds with Arnie and actually kills the triple threat. So he does all the hard work. Carl the doctor helps Peter his gunshot wounds, sort of. He tells him to lie around for two weeks. But he teaches the boys to cook, uh, which he mildly accomplishes. The soundtrack 
I mentioned this film like in early 2000s, low stakes movies, and the soundtrack reflects this just the same. It's unmemorable and often sounds out of place. It was like they, they bought these songs from a MIDI library, and it was often way too loud. It tries to pull on the heartstrings, but neither the writing nor the acting conveyed what they were trying to get across. Uh, meh on the music. Overall, this was, well, not a bad film. It was forgettable in every way. Maz was clearly the best actor in the movie. Some of his trademark intensity shined through. But he didn't have enough to do, story-wise or time-wise. So I'd pass in this movie. I really can't imagine anyone having a good reason to watch this nowadays unless you are an idiot like myself who reviews movies. Well, that was Flickering Lights, and I'm feeling pretty dejected about that. But what is the worst restaurant name you folks have ever heard? I've worked at a number of restaurants, so I've heard some doozies, but I don't want to out anyone in my community, as it were. But let me know down below. Also, as I mentioned, my daughter was six. She'll be getting two reviews this week. And what's up next on Mads Mickelson a month? A much better movie than this one, where next time I will be looking at Valhalla Rising. This has been the Tono Makaya, your favorite demon, but not mine. I love you. Thank you. And goodbye. <laughs>